Art Chat is made possible by the support of the Artistics Harmonies Association. Create your next aha experience with us. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Art Chat. My name is Linda Fissler, and I am your host for today. Uh, in a few minutes, I'll be calling in Michael Harding to talk with us about his new colors, his new primers. We're going to touch a little bit on varnish as well. And... Um, Basically, just a, a few quick announcements, if we can, about the Artistic Harmonies Association. Again, we're in a soft launch. I think I told you a little bit about that uh, a couple art chats ago. John and I were on to talk about uh, what our dreams are for the association. Um, and as you know, Artistic Harmonies Association sponsors Art Chat now. Uh, we have new blogs on our website every Monday and Thursday. The Monday blogs talk a little bit about you know, our art journey, art skills, and things like that. Thursday blogs touch on business, and John just started a new series about valuing your art, so you'll want to drop over and, and read all those good things. Our hard launch, or our, actually our official launch, will start in January. We've got a lot of great things planned. One of the things that we do have coming up, it's a free event. It's on November 4th. It starts at 8 o'clock Eastern time in the United States. It's called Chat, Create, and Cocktails. So you can grab your favorite beverage, hop on to Zoom, and watch me paint, which is probably a lot like watching the grass grow, maybe, but <laughs> it might be a little bit of fun. Um, and grab your, like I said, grab your favorite beverage, and we will have the sound on. So you can ask questions about your business. You can ask questions about your art. You can ask questions to me about what I'm doing on the um, while I'm painting with Michael Harding paints, no less. And we will be um, talking about a lot of great things that'll be coming around. This is our first, what I call paint in. Um, the next one, you are welcome to paint with us, by the way, uh, during this one. Um, but the one after that, we're gonna actually ask that you join us and, and do paint while we are painting and have your Zoom on your canvas so that we can see what you're doing. So we'll twist on that one. So again, this is the first of the chat creating cocktails. Hope you'll join us. Um, to get the link to that Zoom um, meeting, if you want to call it that, you need to sign up for our newsletter because that'll be the easiest way for me to get you the link in the future. So address is Artistic Harmonies ASOC, so A-S-S-O-C dot com. So with that, hello, Michael. How are you doing? Hi, Linda. Hi, Linda. Hi, hi everybody. I'm, I'm great. How are you? doing well um yeah just like uh, michael and i caught up for a few minutes before we started recording this and um we got the lowdown on artistic harmonies i think we really didn't talk much about what michael's been doing but i know he's been busy because he's got some new um products out but before we jump into that i don't think we have any new varnishes but i've been getting a lot of questions michael about um when should i varnish our paints our paintings you know how dry do they have to be and actually have to be pretty dry but um, that kind of thing, what kind of varnish should I use? What's the best way to do that? Um, so if you could touch a little bit on that, I wanted to show oh. everybody, I have my little, I have DeMar varnish, it's a V1. And I'm not sure what all your products are, but if you could just kind of walk through that for us. Yeah, sure. Um, V1, as you've recognized, is Damar varnish. The V2 is a matte varnish. Okay, Damar varnish, uh, it comes from a tree from the Far East, so it's a sort of crystallized uh, plant sap, which um, genuine turpentine has the uh, ability to be a true solvent of it, which is quite interesting. Uh, and when I say true solvent, you can have an apparent solvent like mineral spirits or something, and you can tell this when you try and clean your hands. If you get the Damar crystal dust on your hands, you find it sticky as can be, and you can never really wash it off with any detergent. And the only thing that really gets it off, believe it or not, I know it sounds a bit harsh, is actually wiping yourself with genuine turpentine and, and then using a detergent. So it's not very, <laughs> it's not very, let's not go there. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that was a little harsh. <laughs> yeah, so um, that's, the, that's the strange thing about Damar. It came along or started being used by artists really, from what I can recall in the, in the 19th century, now, the key thing about a varnish, a varnish is, has to be thought of, if you like, as a temporary coat. It's designed to protect your painting from, from the environment, from the atmosphere, from pollutants, dirty rooms, you name it. Um, of course, things are considerably better than they used to be, because back in the 19th century, when we had oil burning lamps, gas burning lamps, then there was considerably more sort of localised pollution. 
Uh, fortunately, today we don't have to worry so much about that, but still varnishing your painting is essential. We recommend that you let the painting dry for a good six months to one year. Now you'll find the books generally say six months, but it's one of those things where a little longer certainly won't do any harm. And there's a couple of reasons for this. Um, you'll have all heard about the fat over lean principle and how oil paint when it dries goes through some quite erratic physical changes as it, as it dries. It, it expands and contracts, expands and contracts. And over the first sort of six to nine months, that's when it's doing it, and I don't want to use the word violently, but that's when it's doing it the most drastically. So you want that all to sort of settle down before you apply your varnish coat. And the other thing, of course, about a varnish is that it would, it would in some ways block and interfere with the absorption of the oxygen or impede it, shall we say. So it's best to leave your painting alone for a good six months to nine months before you even consider varnishing. Now, if you don't varnish, well, it's not the end of the world, but it means in sort of like a hundred years time when, you're, when you're, your painting's hanging in the Grand Met and they, 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 of course, have had millions of people trudging, passing and admiring it for the last hundred years. Um, they come to clean it. And of course, you're getting to a point where they then have got a, a, a greater task ahead of them, as we understand it today. Who knows? In, no, in, in those days, they might have some new invention which helps them enormously. But anyway... The essential thing is to remove dirt physically from that surface of the painting, of course. You're now in direct, if you haven't varnished, you're in direct contact of the dirt with the finished artistic paint statement. And that's where it's more vulnerable because of course, as you can imagine, the poor old restorer having to sort of swab away. Um, the danger is of course, when do they go into the paint? And as is obvious, when you, you, you've got a sort of a brown area, that's when of, of course it's gonna come off on the swabs looking like dirt, but mm -hmm. it's only when they analyze it, they find out it's actually pigment particles. So you can see the, you know, we're trying to avoid things going wrong. So the good thing about a varnish is it, it sort of puts a barrier, a temporary barrier, hundred year barrier on your paint surface so that when the restorer deliberately removes with the aid of solvents, that varnish, um, the dirt and the varnish comes away so in effect, they should be able to get back to your clean painting surface as it was six months after drying. So it's quite a, a simple thing. Now, another reason why you have to wait or it's advised you wait a good six months is because if you've done a lot of glazes, um, and sometimes, of course, you can glaze with Damar, which, of course, is a bit of a problem here. The idea is that you want those to be two completely different stratas on a microscopic scale so that the restorer can use certain solvents to pull away one and the other. This is the one downfall I have to say um, with Damar varnish that if you've also glazed a painting uh, with the Damar medium, which of course is the same thing effectively with oil in instead, there is a danger for the restorer pulling away not just the varnish and the dirt but also some of your glazed artistic statements. <laughs> and this is, I think, in the Rolf Mayer book. Um, it's the one area, dare I say, and you know, I hate to sound slightly arrogant to such a, a man as should be on a pedestal. He gets it slightly wrong there. And um, that's the danger of it. He talks about it if it's completely OK. It is an area of concern. Um, it's actually fortuitous, Linda, you, you raised this point of asking questions about the Damar varnish, because I'm, I'm actually in development of, of three more varnishes, which will... Um, get around this problem of, of, of having uh, too similar a formula, if you like, to uh, glazes. And they're going to be completely icarvely sound, and, and I'm very excited about them. And also, you will be able to apply them, um, should you wish, sooner, although I still would advise people to wait six months. It's not going to, because of that interface surface, because it's a different type of resin we're going to be involving, and I can't divulge that at the moment because that's still at, at formula level. Mm -hmm. um, that hopefully will be quite a, a good step forward to us. There will be a gloss version, a matte ver uh, version, and a sort of a, an intermediate satin ver uh, version of the varnish. So that um, hopefully there's, there's a solution for everyone there. And uh, uh, I stress completely arch archivally sound. So, you know, that's one of many projects I'm working on at the moment. Including um, watercolors, right? Oh yeah, but, you know, <laughs> uh, 
why be why be idle and uh, when you, when you can find a, a sort of massive project to get yourself involved in yes so as linda touched upon our, our watercolors were slowed down for a, a whole host of reasons not just covid there's always an excuse isn't there <laughs> um, has to be <laughs> yeah but we're going to be launching hopefully now sometime in the new year to spring 140 watercolors give or take um with some really Wonderful. exotic um and interesting colors fingers crossed i'm hoping to have a, a manganese blue in there genuine one which is something i'm still sort of working on uh we've managed to locate one um, because, as, as most of you know, the, the manufacture of manganese blue ceased oh, 20 whatever years ago. Mm -hmm. And then, and although it's uh, it's not as a sort of tantalizing blue as, say, pathocyanin blue or as historically as uh, interesting, say, as lapis, it still will bring something to the party. So we're quite, you know, excited about that. We've got loads of things going on. Yes. Well, sounds like it. Primers. I mean, uh, it's... I got to the point where um, I suppose uh, some people have, have put to me that maybe the way that I approach creating art materials is, is a bit like my my version of an art form. And I quite like that idea, actually. Make, it gives it sort of an, another sort of grandiose sort of level. But as, as you will all know who know my products, I, you know, I love what I do and I just love uh, the touchy-feely, tactile nature of the things I make. Mm -hmm. Uh, and as an artist myself, it, it, you know, this is my life. And um, I just get enthralled by being able to discover materials and or, or take an existing thing and, and, and find something new to do with it, something exciting. Um, and as, as you know, Linda, we've, we've just launched three new oil colours, one of which is completely unique to us. You find it in um you and there's the primers and there's the yes yeah we'll get the, back to the primers that's fine the, the guy on the right the perylene violet you normally find in watercolor but you don't i don't know of it in anyone else's oil range and mm. that's pink violet 29 and it has oh it's got it's not a sort of a zingy thing like a quinacridone um in terms of poke your eye out it's 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 got a sort of a smoky velvety quality to it and um so we we put that into both the oils and and the watercolors and uh in and i've a couple of guys have been test driving it before the, the launch one was tim reese and the other one was kwang ho mm -hmm. and um that's a watercolor that kwang did just with a pad for fun resting on his knees one day and he he just sort of knocked that up in about sort of 20 minutes Wow, and that involves that pigment violet twenty nine and and uh, and also the blue, the endanthrone blue, uh, which is the PV sixty. And the thing that Quan was shocked by is the, the depth of the darks. He said, "I've never had a watercolor before that I've been able to get that that amount of depth with." But well, when you're Quan, you can get things <laughs> out of paint that uh, most of us can only dream of. And and. For Tim also, it's become a way of life. He contacted me the other day and said, Michael, have you got any more of that violet? So I had to send him one of my half squeezed out tubes that I'd been using. And um, <laughs> yeah, um, it's funny enough because I've got Tim Reese paintings behind me. If, you, if some of you don't know Tim Tim's paintings, there's, um, there's a picture of my daughter. And then over, let me swing you over here. We've got... Um, uh, that's a Tim Reese of, of me there, and yeah, there's another. So I've, yeah, you know, my home. Actually... I've got Kwong paintings over here, and and um, Ricky Mahikas. I, you know, we we our home is just completely full of art. I'm <laughs> delighted to say. Yes, so well, I, sort of... you probably don't remember, but um, I'm I'm hopeful that our audience does remember that we actually had an art chat with you and Tim while Tim was painting your portrait. So that's right. Yeah, so if you're interested in hearing from Tim and, and his uh, colors that he was using on his palette, and, and also I can't uh, recall exactly what we were talking. Oh, yes, I did, can. Um, they weren't varnishes, they were the balsam. Balsam glaze mediums, five Glaze and six. mediums, yes. Yeah, we yeah. were talking about the glaze mediums and which ones I think Tim uses and, and along with the paints that he uses, his palette that he uses. I'm gonna have to try that violet as well because I think that'll be some some cool things in a landscape like in uh you know maybe some touches of the sky and different things like that because you were saying it was smoky if you get it with indian yellow 
you will not believe what your eyes see. Yeah, so that it's it's been a very exciting period for us. And as I said, the the, the nice thing is that the um, developing all the new pigments for the watercolors. Um, when we formulated them, and I'm I'm seeing these new pigments coming out, and I'm looking at them, and I'm thinking, I wonder what that would be like in oil. So of course, hey presto, we started playing around with more and more into oil. And the other, uh, for me, a revelation is that I will be adding up to 40 new oil colors. Oh, wow. <laughs> so if, if you're just an oil painter out there, then, you know, watch this spot because again, um, we're currently somewhere in the nineties and we're adding sort of, uh, sort of like another 40 or 50% worth. Yeah. Uh, um, and yeah, a lot of fun. Um, yes. It's been, I mean, throughout the COVID, um, we were in some ways, certain things we couldn't carry on with, which allowed me to put time in another direction, which of course was playing around with more pigments. Right. And um, yeah, so we, there's, we, we had a lot, we are still having a lot of fun. I'm still picking and choosing which of the 40s they're gonna be. But when I look at what is in the watercolors, which is not in the oils, then that's why I say up to 40. Yeah. I mean, the likes of, of the uh, the lead based and the, you know, the and anything that's got a heavy metal, which has got questionable toxicity, um, we, we haven't got in the watercolors because obviously a watercolors are more technical term for it, I guess would be an open system. Mm -hmm. um, um, and whereas with oil, it's because it's encapsulated with an oil, you don't have to worry about so many other things um, that you do. I mean, you couldn't make, or you wouldn't want to make a watercolor, shall we say, from lead white. Right. Um, for a whole number of reasons, not just chemical. <laughs> so, um, so let me ask a question. All of the different pigments and um, other materials that go into your, your, your paints, are you having any supply issues because of what's going on? And I'm thinking in terms of the instability in Afghan, Afghanistan and your Afghan lapis and- uh, Yeah, that, that one has been, um, I've been using an Afghan merchant uh, to acquire my, my lapis for some years. And um, he's just announced that he can no longer get the pigment of the grade that we've been working from. Oh, no. And he explained to me that he, he, he secured about 10 tons of it. Oh, who knows, 10 years ago. Yeah. And he's slowly been working through that 10 tons of rocks. And some of it have ended up on, on very high end watch faces, uh, you know, <laughs> as a decorative, you know, because obviously it's a semi precious stone. And I'm right. sure it looks beautiful on the watch face. Um, but we rather paint with it as artists, but yeah. <laughs> I think it's much better to smash it up and use it as, as paint, yeah. yeah. And unfortunately that 10 tons has now run out. Uh, he can still get the lapis, but unfortunately it's about six times the price. Yeah. Um, and the reality of that would mean tubes of paint six times the price. So, and I, I, I you know, I can, I can hazard a guess that even if someone did buy, you know, you, you just ended up, putting it on your mantelpiece as a trophy piece rather than actually using it as a piece of paint. So right. at the moment, I'm afraid the lapis is, uh, if, if there's any out there, it, it's rapidly going. Okay, um, note to self, buy some lapis. Yeah, <laughs> we did fortunately allocate some of the stocks for the watercolor. Mm -hmm. So when the watercolor launches, we, we've, got, we've got a couple of years supply probably of the lapis, depending upon how quickly it sells for watercolor only. Yeah, I'm looking forward to tying your watercolors and, and playing with it. I've been playing with some watercolor markers, which I know when I get your paints, I will probably never touch them again, but just trying to get a little bit into, you know, another medium just to play with and, and have some fun with at the time. But yeah, so um, I'm looking forward to, to playing with those and, and seeing what I can do with those. Yeah, it's, well, we'll have to make sure you get some so you can, you can talk from experience. That would be um, <laughs> I, I didn't want to just bring out another watercolor, which was just another version of everyone else's. And I, I like to think what I've managed to achieve with the oils, if I could replicate that in parallel to the water, uh, in watercolor, that, that's my intention. Because after all, if you bring out something that's the same as everyone else is doing, what's the point? Mm -hmm. And I like to think I've achieved that. And I, I think that in, in some ways, 
Um, I like to think that maybe I've slightly reinvented watercolour because it, it comes out, one or two people have been playing around with them have said this is almost like a concentrate. It's not really, it's, it's almost like a different version of paint. Right. Uh, um, it behaves in quite a different way. It's incredibly powerful, incredibly high pigment content. And um, I have been slightly concerned whether that would be overwhelming for, for some people. Um, and it might be a little bit hard to get used to because the, you know, the initial thing, if the, if someone's used to working with, shall we say, a, a, a watercolor that's readily a, available out there, which doesn't have a lot of strength, you get used to it behaving in a predictable sort of way. And then, of course, you grab the MH and you find that suddenly you've just got a, a obliteration of color. <laughs> and it's good and it's bad in that. I mean, it just takes a while um, I like to think of it. it's a bit like sort of driving a Ferrari. If you've, if you've ever only ever been used to a Chevy pickup or something like that, <laughs> it's sort of suddenly you have your foot on the throttle yeah. and, you, and you've got unquestionable power there. So it's a bit like that with, with color. Um, yeah, wear some sunglasses as well, particularly for the yellows. That sounds wonderful. I, like I said, I can't wait to to try them out. So um, let's get back to some oil colors. We talked about the violet. How about the was in the thon, in the throne blue? Did I say that right? Yeah. Uh, okay. yeah, there's several versions of the way it's spelt and said. It was a pigment that was invented by the Germans in about 1908, if I remember correctly. First of all, it didn't sort of tend to cause many ripples, but it's got a very, uh, you know, blues um, are remarkable for me because they're so sort of, serene and poetic and mm -hmm. sometimes I'm looking at them and I think is there really color there because you I don't know why your mind sometimes just flips and only sees the tonal value of it mm -hmm. um, and that's why it's useful obviously to play around say with an orange mixture for obvious reasons of the complementary um, yeah blues they're just bizarre um, I don't understand them I don't want to understand them just keep playing that's a... <laughs> well, the, the thing is i think if you understand it too much that then it's like trying to understand love it's if you if you analyze love and break it down into its component parts it's no longer there and it's a bit like the uh you know the ex the experience or, or the feeling you have when you look at certain colors and um to overanalyze them um then they cease to be for you what they are and i think um so often we it, 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 maybe in other forms of art Musicians probably have to because of the way that music is reproduced. There has to be a notation system for it. Um, I don't understand colour and I don't want to. Uh, I, I think as long as I can keep the mystery alive for, my, for me, I'll be able to keep doing what I can do. And um, it, it's, it's probably also a bit like the concept for an artist making a perfect painting. Mm -hmm. You can't. And even if you did, then art would cease to exist from that moment on. There'd be no point. Right. I mean that's a huge debate for another another day. But um, yeah. we bring out we've also brought out a, 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 um, a red. It's a red that you've seen in many ra ranges before. We had so many requests from people to introduce a pure red, which is the current X pigment red two five four, and there will be other versions as well, of course, as I add the other colours, uh, uh, the two six four probably as well, but. Um, and that comes from a family of pigments, which is well, it got very well known light fastness. And I, I believe it's the red that gets used on Ferraris, actually, I haven't mentioned once before. Mm -hmm. So very light fast and uh, drives you a long way. Uh, yeah, so um, yeah, I'd, I'd love people to try it. Okay. Um, one thing I, would, I do want to mention, um, as a person who started out with a limited palette, which was ultramarine blue, it was alizarin crimson and cadmium yellow. And then I think I threw in an ivory black um, a little bit along the way and, and titanium white. Um, I do a video which will be available through Artistic Harmonies where I have four different blues and four different yellows and mix a wide variety of greens from that. So it's a little demo video that'll be coming out soon on Artistic Harmonies Association. I'll do a little blog about it. You'll see parts of it. Um, but it is amazing. And the painting of the college cottage behind me over here is done with Michael's paints. Um, and you can see a wide range of greens in there. That little video showed me why I should change up my limited palette, if you will, with different blues and different yellows. It's still quote unquote limited, 
It's a and, lovely painting. Well done. Yeah. Oh, um, thank you. Yeah, that's what yeah, we call that bike barn because we go buy that on our bikes. <laughs> as, as you say, that you know, the artist doctrine normally would be to um, limit the number of things because it's a bit like making a cocktail, and the more things you put into the shaker, the the, the more things that can go erratically wrong. But no, absolutely. Right. You've you've landed a splendid painting there, and. Uh, uh, yeah, the, the 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 danger, of course, would be chaos. But clearly, you have not got chaos. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I always tell my students and and other artists that kind of get into this, you know, I'm always squeezing out the same color of paint on my palette, and I know what I can mix from that. So they kind of get toehold into a you know just a small range of what that water, what that color wheel could be, if you will. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you experiment a little bit, even if you just spend it, I mean, to me, the most fun part of painting is mixing. I could spend all day mixing. Um, oh, yeah. And it's one of these things, you learn so much, even if you just take a little bit of your paints and mix them out, you start to expand your memory into what it takes to mix a certain color that'll just make a difference in your, in your uh, painting uh, as you're doing it. And I'm sure you could probably see the same thing for most of the watercolors that you've been playing with uh, throughout, too. So playing is an important part of staying creative and and expanding that muscle memory into seeing other colors and mixing other colors and of course the other part of that is actually studying color out in nature but it's a matter of of just you know having some fun and and getting away from what you're used to because it when you walk away from that new painting that has that different mix in it you just you just feel so much more accomplished at least i did anyway it's a very interesting point because in some ways you could argue that if you if you're using the same mode of operandum every time you're sort of producing the same painting every time right but then when you consider the ancient guys they they didn't have so many options and you look at the you know the, the generally the, the steady limited palette say of the of the the dutch school um i think of course of rembrandt um and he went for that form of stability Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I've said this many times, but I would be fascinated to know what they would make of our opportunities we now have with colour. Um, I think Monet would have would have wanted to relive his life um, yes. for obvious reasons. I think Rembrandt would have probably looked at the array of colours and said, this is crazy, what do you need all this for? <laughs> right. Yeah, but, but the need is, is you can create so many more. I mean, as as Kevin McPherson said to me when he was, when he was mentoring me, we have, and you can argue this too, nine or 10 values, but we have millions of colors. Yes, indeed. And, and that's the big difference is just understanding the difference between those values and those millions of colors and how to achieve them. Well, there's infinite numbers of colors because yeah. you can always just put another little mini speck of another one in and technically you, you know the color will have changed, although you right. may not be able to perceive it. Right. Yeah, but no, okay. it's a, did, did you by chance use my green gold? Um, I have not yet. No. That has peculiar things going when it when it <laughs> interacts with other colors. I mean, I'm stating the obvious. When you put it next to a red, and when you mix, um, I'm trying to think something like um, a quinacridone into it slightly, and you get a momentary sort of there's that black moment, and then it's just an explosion of differences as well, and and, and that will. You know, I often say that, you know, every painting's a million paintings within it because mm -hmm. just mixing in your palette, that little combination I've just uh, just mentioned will just take you off down a rabbit hole. Yeah, I, I went, um, I had the ultramarine blue, ultramarine blue just because everybody seems to have that on their palette. Then I did the yeah. lapis. Um, I put, threw in the blue shade of the cobalt teal and I think I used your um, night's blue. Is that... King, right. King's oh, blue. King's blue. Yes, and I use nice, King's right, blue. I like <laughs> sorry, oh, I demoted him. I demoted him. I'm sorry. No, it's the Duke's blue. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I wouldn't put it past you. You'll come out with something like that. <laughs> so. Oh yeah, I know. It's um, <laughs> yeah. It's, some of it's fun. Sometimes it's fun to have a new name like Deep Purple. <laughs> yes, and, and and but I mean, when you try and name, I mean, my guys called me up this week because we were naming. Uh, pigment orange 62 which is going to be in both um, oil and watercolor and uh, they said come on you've got to think of a name for it and you can't just call it 
um, pigment orange 62, and it's it's got the most peculiar pigment name. It's benzolazadine, and it's you know no one's going to want to call it that, although that will be on the tube so that people know the pigment family. Oh, wow. uh, but it's a high, highly light, fast, uh, um, you know, really zingy orange. And I said to my guys, well, look, describe it in your own words. And so, well, it's much more brilliant than any other orange we've got. And I said, well, there you go. Brilliant orange. <laughs> it's going to tell everyone what's in the tube. And you can see our label anyway, because obviously we, we put real paint on. Yeah, the, the the ones that I shared, it was laying on a, a piece of a canvas, I'm assuming, or whatever, that the strip so that you could see the color behind it on the ones that we were sharing. So, all right, so let's jump into your primers. So these are your new primers. So tell us about these. Okay, right. Well, clearly we have now color. Um, let me just talk very briefly to remind people about the significance of the white we introduced, which was the first one, obviously, uh, about four years ago. I, over the years, when, when people call me up with, 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 with problems with paint, it, it, you, understandably, you get the same reoccurring um, comments that a lot of a lot of people sort of come across as, as they as they're new to to oil oil paint. Uh, usually, what happens is that they they paint a painting and it looks lovely, and then the next day it's gone dull and matte. Now, usually, the cause of that is because they've painted on a on a an acrylic primer which has got a very porous surface, which therefore sucks out all the oil, renders the paint looking dull and matte and pretty horrible. Um, and we all enjoy oil paint for the luscious stained glass window quality and of course you want I personally want that to be retained I like to think that when I put a brush stroke down that's the brush stroke I'm going to have once the painting's finished and dry certain colors do change slightly like the umbers particularly but anyway so yes we did the white um, and what happens is we we, we managed to find uh, an acrylic resin that isn't so porous so it doesn't suck all the oil out it still has good interphase with the paint above, and we put a, a microscopically ground mica into it as well, so it gives a little tooth. And you can, if you put a little bit of the acrylic primer in your finger, you won't be able to see it, but you can just feel it. It feels like ground glass in there, so it gives it that little bit of uh, adhesion, and it also drags with the brush, therefore slightly. Um, so we 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 achieved a huge success with that white, and then I was understandably bombarded by people asking, "Are you going to do sort of like a neutral grey?" and uh, and are you going to do a black? And are you going to do this and that? And I thought, well, I've got to, got to listen to people. It's obviously what they want. And so there we have three examples of, of colours which are coming. And you can see they're, they're arriving into the United States in about the next sort of three weeks. Once we get the uh, our environmental medicine organisation, which does the toxicological labelling for them, we can then release them, So, which will be imminent. Um, we have a titanium buff, which is the one on the bottom left there, which is, of course, based on our unbleached titanium dioxide, which, as you can see, is a sort of nice neutral biscuity buff tone. Mm -hmm. um, again, it's, you know, I know I know when painters start out, invariably what they do, they start with a white canvas and then, as they call it, knock it back a bit uh, by putting some type of either a scumbly surface or a wash over. Some people like working with say, a completely uniform surface, like an opaque grey. So yes, we've got we've got the um, bleached titanium there. We also have now this one's going to be a little more. Uh, we've we've I don't know if your mouse has seen by everyone where you, but the, <laughs> the okay the transparent red there is a little bit of a fun thing I've put in. It's based on transparent red oxide and it's the sort of burnt sienna shade. And the idea is that when you when you look at a canvas, uh, invariably what people like doing is they like usually using a, a transparent color such as say burnt sienna and they produce a washing oil all over it so that they can have that sort of grisel sort of finish so we i thought it would be fun to just do it with 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 oil um with the acrylic primer so the idea of that is it's a, it's a two-part priming you do one layer in white and then one layer in the in the transparent red we've also got semi-opaque versions when i say semi-opaque the the normal concept of a primer that is, is the same burnt sienna shade as well coming and raw sienna. So of those four, we've got transparent raw sienna, transparent um, burnt sienna, and, and, and then um, the normal versions of those. So that's, that's four. Now, the one that I'm personally uh, really excited about, and I've started using this in my own painting, is that um, 
that olive green at the top there. And I put that together really with portrait painters in mind. I found that quite a lot of portrait artists like working on the sort of terra verti, olivey, call it what you want, green, hmm. um, so that they can play around with their flesh tone colours as complementary. And, and, you know, I, I, I must be honest that after my 40 odd years of making paint and I introduced these things, I'm doing it because I'm having fun and I want people to as well. So it's not as if I'm not somehow saying that these are things which are going to change your life as a painter. Uh, but as, as you touched on, Lynn, sometimes it's, it's a healthy thing to experiment and mm -hmm. uh, take the untrodden path, shall we say, and, and see what comes out. And uh, so that, that was the idea. So in all, we're going to have 10 primers um, from the white, the neutral grey, the titanium buff, the, the siennas, which I've just talked about, the, the olive green and a transparent one. So that, you know, if you're painting on linen and rather like the 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 um the natural linen surface then we've got a a transparent version as well so just two good coats of that transparent and it renders the support uh impervious as a, as as a as a as a buffer zone if you like to the to the support so for instance if you're painting on a wooden panel and you happen to like the you know the grain effect or the tone of it you you've got that option with the transparent as well so in all the B10 I'm trying to think if I've got them all it's hard to sort of sit here and sort of, <laughs> but but yeah, there there will be ten in all. Uh, they all behave in exactly the same way. They all dry within like an hour or so. They can be intermixed. So if you wanted to say, uh, if you wanted to make your own tone of grey, then you could take the black and the white and, and mix accordingly and put a bit of the titanium buff in or any of the others. Um, I mean, if you like, it's the, think of it this way: it's the same vehicle in every case, but with just a, a pigment added. Mm. So it, it's been. It's, it's been fun formulating that and sort of trying to sort of pick and choose which colours we will include. I know someone's going to call me up and say, have you done this colour? And they're, they're going to suggest a, uh, I, I did at one point think maybe I should do the primaries as well. But you know, if I'm not careful, I'm going to end up being a, an, an acrylic paint maker as well. Which, <laughs> but these are primers. Um, they're also very light fast. The say again? I said a non-absorbent being the key. Indeed, because they are designed so that they don't suck the oil out and leave your paint looking dull. It's a very, it's, it was a hard product to sort of um, name because I don't like calling something an acrylic gesso um, because gesso imply, I mean, traditional gesso, of course, was rabbit skin glue and, and, right. and chalk. And this is, and, and I, I don't think that when you take a, a modern material like acrylic resin, to start calling it gesso, no, to call it what it is, because mm -hmm. um, that confuses people. And there's enough confusion in this industry already with, with materials. Mm -hmm. And I had to come up with a, a, a way of telling people what it did. And so the, the other thing is read the label, because that'll tell you exactly about it. And we've obviously got the website to support it in, mm -hmm. in more detail. Um, we could have called it non-flattening or non-dulling or but then it just it becomes even there's there's no perfect name to give it that other than it's an acrylic primer which doesn't make your paint go dull mm -hmm. yeah so um let's let's talk a little bit about because there are so many different terms used a lot of folks will talk about toning their canvas and most of the time that is done with the acrylic paint like we're talking about and this would be toning your canvas with this particular primer absolutely you can you can either use them over white um you've got to make sure you have enough coverage so if you're going to use one of these very thinly to achieve your color make sure in that case you put two good layers of the white down because um if you did effectively what be one and a half layers of, of a, then there's a, a danger that if you've got a thin patch and your linen hasn't got enough of a barrier protection then it could it could let you down at that point and then you'd have telltale oil stains coming through on the back of the canvas which is always a a, a telltale thing and i mean I, I remember artists years ago coming to me saying why why have i got these crescent shaped lines on the back of you know on you know where the paint's gone dull uh on the front and it's in a crescent shape and it's usually when it's a big canvas and someone's someone's reaching up and the, you know <laughs> and the arm's gone up like that and they've missed it a strip which comes out as a crescent because of the the way the arm moves and then i usually ask the question well 
tell me, if you look at the back of the canvas, have you got a, a stain matching that crescent? And they go, yes. How did you know? And I say, well, you didn't cover the canvas well enough there with your prime. And what's happened, of course, a certain amount of the oil is seeping through mm -hmm. into the linen, and that's the telltale stain. So that's what we want to avoid. Um, you've got to have enough of a coverage of whatever um, medium you're using. I say medium because I don't I have to qualify. I don't want to get people confused again with oil painting <laughs> mediums. Whatever your chosen material is at this point to act as a barrier, make sure it does its job properly. Uh, and I always try and impress upon people to, to test on, on, on other bits of material before they commit to a major, you know, the, use one of those little offcuts of strip of linen or something you have if, if you're unsure about are you going to like an effect or not. Right. Um, so another additional question that just kind of pops in my head when we're still talking about primers. Um, I unfortunately cannot stretch my own canvas. So um, I tend to buy the, the canvases that are a little bit higher in price because I want my, as we talked before on many art chats, we want our foundation or the, what we're sure. painting on to be, you know, as good as the paint that we're using, if not better. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I'd switch to an oil primed canvas, a Belgium linen. Yeah. And there are also acrylic Belgium linens uh, primed a pre-primed if you want to call it that yeah uh, available as well um are those that have come primed in acrylic is it it's not like yours it's is that an absorbent acrylic then and i should then you prime would with have to try it and see i mean okay. the test of course is if you put a thin layer of paint and you find it goes dull the next day uh, then it's a porous acrylic, and, and, and from my point of view, it's not going to do you any favours. Um, you can, uh, in most cases, and, I, and there is, I have to be careful there, because I have come across people who have applied my non-absorbent acrylic primer to a Belgian linen, which has been pre-acrylic primed, and it, I won't say it doesn't work, but the effect is not so good so again, experiment and test. And I, I'm afraid I, and I sincerely cannot remember the, the particular type of, of linen here. Now, the other thing is, of course, if you are painting on, in your case, say a Belgian linen and, and you've got um, an MO, mode of operandum that you particularly like, and you, you then sometimes if, if, if you feel that you've already got that area of your painting technique nailed, mm -hmm. Then, then don't don't fiddle with it. I mean, if yeah. any bust, don't fix it. Is what I'm saying. So you might you might find there's a certain confidence in in um, continuing with your existing material. But however, what I do stress is that if, if you are a guy a girl who likes to uh, stretch and prime your own linen, and I stress linen here because let's keep away from cotton dark. That's yes, <laughs> that's, that's for students and, and amateurs. It's it's not designed for longevity. Full stop. Yeah. There's a time when we have to lift up our materials as well as you, you, you start out with what you can because you're learning. And, yeah. and then there's a time when you need to become professional and use the professional Absolutely. products. Absolutely, and then treat yourself and you'll find that your, your execution of the painting will be a, a, you know, a lot easier. Or more. Well, it, it, it will suddenly then the love of the materials come into play more. And, exactly. And it, um, it always reminds me of that old expression, can't make a a silk purse out of a sow's ear. <laughs> um, I, I, you, you could argue that um, if Velasquez or Titian were here and they, and you gave them a horrible pencil and a horrible piece of paper, they'd still produce you a masterpiece because of who they are. Mm -hmm. But I often think, well, it could have gone that extra 10% if they'd had really nice materials at the time. Uh, yeah. You know, there's several elements to creating a masterpiece clearly. and. Um, Good materials certainly help you a long way of the uh, way down the road. Yes, learned that yeah. lesson with you. <laughs> yeah, sorry, but we, we digress. Yeah, yeah. so um, if you are a guy or girl who likes uh, priming and sizing your own paintings, uh, a lot of the vegans, of course, and the vegetarians get frustrated with the concept of rabbit skin glues. Sure, okay, I'm not here to present for or against that argument. Um, uh, as to as far as I can recollect, it's it's the non-absorbent acrylic primers are vegan. I think it's what because they've got all these weird. I just want to make sure in my head. I don't think there's any material in them that 
as a result of anything to do with an animal whatsoever. Uh, inc incidentally, our, um, our watercolours have honey in, and I was uh, quietly corrected by a, an artist friend who is a vegan, and she pointed out to me that you might want to look into the sourcing of your honey because, uh, and I thought this would be wonderful because it's so natural, um, but mm. she said that, um, and this is suddenly into another, digressing into another world, that the beekeepers can sometimes be very ruthless with their hives oh. and, uh, and can cull a hive for commercial reasons. So that's why she says honey is not always considered vegan, but that's, wow. a, that, that's another point. But yeah. no, as I sit here, I think that I'm right in saying that all the, all the ingredients of the non-absorbent acrylic primer um, are vegan friendly. And our paints, of course, are always solvent free. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's... that's okay. What should we talk about, Linda? <laughs> okay. So um, one of the things that, that I've gone away from actually is getting acrylic primed canvases be and have gone more towards the oil primed with the Belgian linen, just because yeah. I've, I've seen a difference in the, the finished product and I actually prefer it. So again, these old hands just don't let me stretch the canvas the way I like to stretch it. So, so do you have a bit of arthritis or something like yeah, that? Yeah, I do, especially like the baby finger, you could see it going, right. turning over. Yeah. So yeah. Oh, it's, yeah. I, yeah I've got it, it with my toes actually, but, um, yeah. and, and Tom doesn't like doing it. <laughs> I let Tom do it. <laughs> he wouldn't understand. So, oh come on! Of course he yeah, would. He worries about me with the you know I have a, a power stapler somewhere around here when I used to do it, and every once in a while I would always have safety glasses on because I'm just a klutz anyway. And then all of a sudden I'd shoot the the, the staple out towards the wall, and it's like, well, it's a good thing it was facing away from me. <laughs> so. Yeah, indeed. I mean, even even from one of those staple guns that goes ka-ching. I'm not talking about a, <laughs> a big air pressure thing. <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's one of those things, safety first every time. And Are you going to be out in stores um, anytime um, soon or is this post-pandemic you'll start doing that again? I think probably once the pandemic things really calm down. I, I'm going to the UK next week with Karen for about five, six weeks. Um, we might, she's proposed that I go to Glasgow today to do a, a talk. So we're, we're just, we're discussing that one to see if we can fit it in. Um, at the moment, we haven't got anything planned within the United States. I'm hoping that we'll be doing the convention. We did all the painters of America okay. uh, over in Santa Fe or down in Santa Fe, whichever way I'd like to look at it, which was a lot of fun seeing old friends down there. And that was the, the first one, of course, we've done in, in 18 months. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to be looking at the, you know, when the guys like the portrait show people and the plein air people get, get going again properly. The virtual events, of course, have been fun and, and saved us in many ways, which, which is great. It gets everyone together because, as as I often say, it's, it, you know, if you're painting on your own, it, it, it can be very daunting at times because it's sort of, if you haven't got people calling into your studio and giving you encouragement, it, it's it's it can be tough um and we all need encouragement mm -hmm. there's, there's always that day we think why am i doing this yeah uh, you know you can beat yourself up about it and, and we all need to be lifted you, you've got to you've got to know when to beat yourself up and do better in your painting and also uh, pep yourself up as well so it's but no at the moment we we go into the uk to, to work on formulating next week and develop a few things and i mean looking forward to that and right I recently became a grandfather, so I'm also Oh, congratulations! Be... And my daughter, my granddaughter, is called Sienna. Um, oh, I nice. didn't insist upon my name. My my daughter, <laughs> her partner, chose the name. I, um, so yeah, that that's catch up and see my my lovely little granddaughter, who's now just over three months old. Congratulations again! So Thank you. I didn't want to just kind of gloss over that because that's really no, exciting. Not so. I'm not the first person yeah. to be a grandparent, but uh, yeah. We all, we all, you know, it's a lovely moment in one's life. Yes. And um, with Artistic Harmonies, what, at some point we're going to be starting um, maybe not, don't think of it like a plein air painting conference or um, oil painters or things like that, but we, we will have get togethers, if you will, um, conferences. Um, would love to have you talk about technical 
the technical to, aspects yeah. of paints and things like that so that we can get a better understanding and, and get our head around oh. that technical mastery. Please, please invite us. We'd love that. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know if we would have a vendor area or whatever. This is just off the top of my head. If John oh, were here, you know, but, that's, but that's I think cool. your understanding of the, the technical mastery of paints and the, you know, I, I hate to call you a chemist because I don't think you, I can I'm call a you a chemist if I'm you a, want. I'm a painter. <laughs> yeah. First of all, um, I'm not a chemist. I, um, Chemistry is for really clever people, you know. Not <laughs> yeah, I didn't um, pass it. So, <laughs> no. Just, uh, the more I look at it, the more I realise I can't. It's just it's a, <laughs> it's a it's another world of of craziness. But uh, yeah. no, I'm, I'm I'm I like I like my start point of being an artist. Yes. Uh, and using eyes as my scientific first instruments when I'm making paint and looking at paint, and uh, you know, in a sense, I I, I think that's where if you like I score because I, I approach this as an artist right I'm yeah. happy, happy to be involved always great great and um when your watercolors come out and any of your new colors come out please drop me a note because we'd love to have you back to talk about them again I will I, I gladly and I should have to get get some samples over there too so don't be oh, that'd be wonderful don't be shy <laughs> about pestering me because uh, you know, obviously well, you're, a, you're a good friend so I know. Yeah, I know. Again, thank you, Michael, for joining us. Um, I always okay. love hearing about your products. Uh, it makes me think about different ways that I could possibly use them in my technique and and ways to expand my technique. So uh, growing well, as an you. artist is always, always important. Thank you for considering me. And if I can just say one thing to the to the artists out there. Sure. Ever you have any crazy question, you know, you might think after the after this, uh, this event with Linda that Oh, he didn't quite explain X, Y, and Z. Drop me a line. Mm -hmm. You can find uh, how to communicate from our website, which of course is at uh, www.michaelharding.co.uk, and just do the you know the normal find the contact page and drop me a line. I'd love to hear from you. Yeah, Michael is very personable. He does mean that. So um, I was very happy to meet him. Gosh, back in 2012, Michael. Ooh, Weekend with the Masters. San Diego. San Diego. <laughs> I remember it well. Yeah. It was yeah. Really yeah. Yeah. San Diego, that was a great setting too, that the hotel there. That was wonderful. So it was a great event because I got to know many, many people who became very good friends after that. Yes. So anyway, so again, thank you. Appreciate it. Um, always good to hear from you and Karen. And um getting to know your daughter is is interesting as well. Joelle. Her mother's French, and so it's a traditional French name. Tuning in and listening to us. Um, it's been a fun time. Always great spending time with you and uh, we will be at back in our chat in a couple weeks. So we'll see you then. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you. chat is made possible by the support of the Artistics Harmonies Association. Create your next aha experience with us.